First of all, I don't think that you need to spend as much time as uh, people think you need to spend in the gym. You know, my approach is you go into the gym, you hit the thing hard, uh -huh. you hit it fast, and then you pack up and go home. So you want to get in great shape, but you haven't got three or four hours a day to spend in the gym. Well, don't worry. Today, Dr. Nick Evans is here. He's an orthopedic surgeon here in Los Angeles, and he's the author of Men's Body Sculpting. He's going to tell you how to get maximum results with minimum time. Pleasure to have you here today, Dr. Evans. Greg, it's a pleasure to be on your show. So, okay, you know, I think everybody wants to get in great shape. If they, you know, if, you could, if there's just a magic pill or bullet or whatever the hell it is, you know, that you could take and you would get in great shape, people would do it. But who has the time to spend, you know, four hours a day in the gym to look like a bodybuilder? But yet, and you being a doctor had that same problem. But you did it. How did you do it? <laughs> well, first of all, I don't think that you need to spend as much time as uh, people think you need to spend in the gym. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing the right thing, then you can get away with uh, half hour, 45 minutes in the gym, three or four times a week, oh. and see results. So that's it. And is that all you do is four times a week for three? Pretty much that's what I do uh, on a regular basis. Okay. And you have, I mean, just to show the book here one more time, I mean, you really do have, in fact, I bookmarked a photo here. I mean, you definitely have the bodybuilder thing going on. So you can really get those kind of results in 30 to 40 minutes, just four times a week? Wow. Uh, that's what I do. That's what <laughs> okay, I do. you hear it right here. So then what are those people who are doing who spend four hours a day in the gym, I guess? I, I think it's all about going to the gym and choosing exactly what you want to do in terms of the exercises and executing, you know, the right exercises in the right fashion. And, um, you know, my approach is you go into the gym, you hit the thing hard, uh -huh. you hit it fast, and then you pack up and go home. Right. And, and you've got all kinds of tips in there for how you can really intensify your workout and that sort exactly. of thing. But I think one of the main things you say, though, really, um, well, first of all, it depends on your body type. It depends on your body type to a certain extent because what the body type um, determines is what your, what your goal should be. Mm -hmm. And it's much better in terms of uh, a fitness or body sculpting approach to have a, if you want, a short-term goal. Mm -hmm and maybe even a longer-term goal, but you shoot for the short-term goals. Because mm -hmm. if you hit the short-term goal, it's more realistic for you to make that change in that short amount of time. And if you make that change, uh -huh. then you know, you're know you rewarded. You see the reward, you're encouraged, your motivation goes up, and then you can shift on to the next goal. Okay. It might be for someone who's overweight, mm -hmm. the goal might be to, to lose weight and get back to a more of a normal body weight with less body fat. Yeah, yeah, that's my goal. So, so that sure. approach is a slightly different approach to someone who might be lean and wants to put on muscle. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Those are the two extremes. And someone who's naturally muscular or, or athletic, you know, they may, they be, may be a little more gifted when it comes to gym time in, in, in the terms that things come a little easier for those mm -hmm. middle ground mesomorph type people. Mm -hmm. So genetics does play a part. Right? Yes, I believe so. Okay, and you have different routines, though, depending on whether somebody does want to take off the fat or put on muscle or do both. So I guess, well, first, probably, well, you know, when I read those studies that like two-thirds of Americans are overweight, maybe we should start with the uh, taking off the fat part. So what, what if your main goal, at the moment that's my main goal, too, uh, take off the fat. How do you take off the fat? Well, I think the, the, main, the main thing to realize if you're trying to lose body weight <clears throat> is that what you need to do is address the calories. Mm -hmm. And calories is a measure of energy, the amount of energy that a, a body puts out during exercise. Uh -huh. It's also the measure of uh, energy that's contained within foodstuffs. Okay. So the, I think what one thing that, one thing that is the uh, um, primary goal is that if you're overweight, you want to consume less calories mm -hmm. per day than you're expending in terms of your exercise and daily living. If you're on a negative cal calorie balance uh -huh. on a daily basis, then your body has to go into the fat stores to mm -hmm. extract that extra energy for your, for your daily activities. Mm -hmm. So being in a negative calorie balance so must what? mean that some, that energy is coming from somewhere mm -hmm. and it has to come from the fat stores. And so hence, a negative calorie balance on a daily basis is, means that you're just ever so slowly dropping that body fat. Okay, so watch the calories, keep the calories low. And I think you also say um, you have guidelines for whether, you know, what you should be eating as well, not just the total calorie count, which you should watch, but um, 
you know, for instance, I think if you're trying to lose weight, you said you should eat more protein and less carbohydrates and that kind of thing. If, if you, yes, if you go back to, I mean, I have a guideline where your body weight keys into how much your maintenance calorie intake should be. Mm -hmm. And as a rule of thumb, um, if you take your body weight in pounds, multiply that by 10, mm -hmm. that should give you sort of maintenance calorie intake for the average person who might be involved in a sedentary job and goes to the gym at night. Okay. So let's say you weighed uh, 200 pounds, uh -huh. then you multiply that by 10, and, and that figure gives you 2,000 calories a day, which is roughly your maintenance calorie intake. Okay. So based on that, if you say you're allowed 2,000 calories a day, that has to come from three main food sources, mm -hmm. protein, carbohydrate, and fat. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, in, terms of, in terms of being healthy on the one side mm -hmm. and losing um, body weight or body fat, the, 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 anyone's diet should essentially be a fairly low fat diet. Mm. So the fat content of those calories should be, you know, 10 or 20 percent mm. in terms of the fat that's in your diet. And that should be, that's, that's, a, that's a given for any kind of diet that I describe in the book. Then that leaves us with the protein versus the carbohydrate content. Mm -hmm. And if you're, so the, what you're left with is 10 um, percent going to fat and the 80 or 90 percent coming from either protein or carbohydrates. Okay. If you, the more carbohydrates you consume, the more tendency that the body will have to store energy and maybe then transfer that to body fat okay. at the end of the day if it's unused. So cutting back on the carbohydrates, mm -hmm. if you want to lose body fat, is probably the way to go. So that ratio, protein-carbohydrate, will, will go up in favor of protein and go down a little in terms of carbohydrate. Okay. And that's what I would recommend in terms of a fat loss diet uh -huh. would be the carbohydrate may, might be 50%, the protein might be 50% of your diet, mm -hmm. the carbohydrate sh shifts down to 40%, okay. and the remaining 10% would be fat. And I think you have a formula as well for calculating um, how much protein you should eat. It's, um, was it 10 grams of protein? It's, on or? average, if you're working out and you're trying to lose body fat, but also, you know, shape up and gain some muscle, mm -hmm. then the rule of thumb would be one gram of protein per pound of body weight okay. per day. But that's if you're more, that's for the, the bodybuilder athletic type. Okay. For someone who's just dieting to lose fat, that isn't necessarily uh, such an important criteria. However, okay. if you manipulate the carbohydrate and protein content, mm -hmm. I think that has a key to, to fat loss at the end of the day. Now, I noticed um, when you mentioned you, you concentrate more on protein and carbohydrates and, and, um, and keeping the fat low. I don't think you ever say the word Atkins in the book once, but it's hard not to think of the Atkins diet when you're reading this. So there's sort of an indirect slam on the Atkins diet in there, right? Or you, you don't seem too crazy about the whole... Well, I, th I think one important thing from my, res my perspective is the book that I wrote was to, is, is a body sculpting book which, which, it, in, which tr attempts to instruct people on you know, building their body, losing body fat, you know, both processes going on at the same time, mm -hmm. if you so wish. Yeah. Generally speaking, the diets that are out there in terms of fat loss, um, whatever it might be, and you mentioned the Atkins diet, mm -hmm. these are diets that tend to be um, formulated for people who either do no exercise or maybe they're couch potatoes, mm -hmm. um, and whose primary goal is to lose body weight mm -hmm. and maybe body fat, okay. but it does not address, sometimes doesn't over, or address the overall health aspect and whether or not you're actually going to gain muscle at the right. same time as losing body fat. So it's not really aimed for so there's bodybuilders. The, correct. There's, there's a body sculpting or athletic type of fat loss diet mm -hmm. versus the general public fat loss diet. And I think the, no matter what the diet is, I think in terms of, if you think in terms of, you know, medical health. Mm -hmm. It, it makes sense to me that the, that, the, that the dietary fat content of your diet should be kept fairly low because we know what happens with the high fat content to your arteries yeah, and to your cardiovascular yeah. health. Yeah, that's always made me wonder. Well, I like the fact in the book, you know, being a doctor, you um, definitely have done your homework and, and you're up on the studies and you really have gone about this very systematic, you know, very methodolic, met, uh, you know, very precise way. You've really analyzed everything. And so, you know, how did you, I'm assuming that wasn't accidental, you really did look through all the literature and really try well, to come up with a scientific way of getting in shape, not just a hit or miss kind of. Absolutely. I mean, you know, my approach has been, has been 20 years in, in its evolution. And the tw that 20 years has been me going to the gym mm -hmm. 
-hmm. on a regular basis and 20 years of, of me undertaking a medical education in terms of anatomy, physiology, biochemistry and then um, as a physician and all the while seeing what's out there in the popular magazines, mm -hmm. seeing what's out there in the scientific uh, uh, realm and putting that into practice using my own thoughts and my own practical experience in the gym to gel this all together and come up with a system which makes scientific sense but is also uh, practical uh -huh. and based on my outcome works. Okay, well we'll find out what does work in just a minute. We'll be right back with Dr. Nick Evans. He's the author of Men's Body Sculpting. And we're back with Dr. Nick Evans, author of Men's Body Sculpting. Okay, so what do you do when you're in that gym for 30 or 40 minutes? What, what kind of exercises are you doing? And that's what I want to know. How do you get in this kind of shape? Basically, in terms of myself at the gym, I first of all believe that, you know, if you've been in the gym for an hour, then essentially you've lost all your power. Hmm. Whatever, you should, whatever you want to be doing at the gym in terms of strength training or body sculpting, uh -huh. you should aim to do that in about 45 minutes, but certainly minutes. be done within an hour. This this is what I call the the strength endurance continuum. On this on the one end you've got the the strength training, which is short sharp bursts of activity, mm -hmm. such as the the weightlifters and powerlifters might do. At the other extreme you've got an endurance type of training, which mm -hmm. marathon runners might undertake. Yep. And you can see that those two uh, extremes have very different physical characteristics. Mm -hmm. And so in the middle ground, we're not training for, in terms of body sculpting, we're not training for strength purely. We're not training necessarily for endurance. The middle ground is where you're taking um, as much weight as you can handle on that exercise for, let's say, eight to ten repetitions. Okay. And at that tenth repetition, that's where you will fail on that weight because your body can't shift that weight any longer at that tenth repetition. And so that's all you need is eight to ten so reps. So your muscle is failing on that tenth rep. Mm -hmm. And that, when the muscle fails, is what stimulates the muscle to grow when you go out of the gym, recover and repair the muscle tissue. Okay. So you sh what I aim for is to, first of all, take your workout time. That's got to be done within an hour. Mm -hmm. If you go beyond that, then you're, you're, you're functioning on reserve fuel. The energy that's within your muscles for the short, short sharp burst activity uh -huh. associated with muscle growth has gone by the time you've been working out for an hour. Mm -hmm. You're then functioning on, on uh, gaining energy from other sources within the body, mm -hmm. and the muscle is, is essentially then on, on a cruise control. Mm -hmm. And if you're on cruise control, you can't uh, train with enough intensity to stimulate muscle growth. So given the fact that your workout time, let's call it 45 minutes, uh -huh. then you want to allot you know, whatever exercises you're going to do that day, whatever body parts you're going to work out into that 45 minutes. Okay. And the, the, the novice or beginner trainer might work their whole body in that 45 minutes, mm -hmm. picking one exercise per body part. Or they might, say, divide up their workouts over the course of the week into uh, upper body, lower body. So you'd work your upper body, and then the next workout might be legs. Right. So by, the, by splitting your body parts up, mm -hmm. it allows you more time in your 45 minute workout to do that particular part of your body. So you can really isolate in on that. Yes. Plus you say your body needs you know, rest time or recovery Absolutely. about five to seven days after. If that. you have an intense workout for any given muscle part, let's say your chest, mm -hmm. and you hit that hard and you, you know, you've taken two or three exercises and you go to failure with that 10th rep on that last set, mm -hmm. and that's, that's, that's a big enough insult in the muscle to warrant a time period of up to five to seven days for mus mm. muscle repair, recovery, and therefore growth to occur. So you could get away with one exercising each body part once per week. That's pretty much the the uh, regime that I use. Mm. So you don't, I, you know, I always thought you needed at least twice a week if you want to get bigger. So that's interesting to hear that you don't. There's different approaches, and I think the approach that I use, again, is based a little on science, is the fact that if the muscle is hit hard mm -hmm. once a week. It will take five to seven days for that muscle to recover and then grow. Mm -hmm. You can work out that same body part again that same week. Mm -hmm. But overall, with time, you might actually you know, enter into the uh, ballpark of overtraining so that you're tearing the muscle down, you're, you're training it, but it just doesn't have that chance to grow. So you don't actually get bigger size. even though you're 
try and that's that. the problem with a lot of people. They work out too much. Mm -hmm. They work out too often. And so they're always tired. They're always lethargic or lacking energy. And they might be in a certain level of shape. They might lose body fat. But when it comes to gaining muscle, that's where they might be deficient. Yeah, and again, I just really like the fact that you seem to have come up with a scientific way of doing this because, and then you realize again how much people are probably being counterproductive in their workouts, you know. Which I believe is probably so. why I'm not in the shape I want to be in, <laughs> which is the scary thing when I was reading the book. Well, again, my system has, has always been um, created primarily with myself in mind, someone who has a busy schedule. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going to the gym for less than an hour, three or four times a week, what is that? I mean, that's less than three hours a week oh, in the great. gym to create you know what you would regard as, as, as a physique that works for you or a shape that works for you and really that's all it needs and I th one of the techniques you came up with was um, talking about you know hitting well I think you have isolation exercises to really like zero in on a muscle let's say the bicep or something and then then you um, have more compound exercises do you want to talk right. about how that works you know well yes the, 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 the system that I use kind of flips the traditional thinking on its head. Uh, the old school way of working out would be that you'd go into the gym and you'd bang out some bench press and that would be the, the, the primary strength building exercise, a compound movement involving the shoulders, the elbows, mm -hmm. working the chest, the, the front deltoids. And then you'd finish up after that with maybe an isolation exercise like the chest fly, mm. which is then just mainly working that chest muscle. Mm. And that to me seems almost like a backward approach for a bodybuilding purpose, and especially for people who are um, coming in to the, to, to the realm of working out. Mm -hmm. One of the things that people find difficult, uh, difficulty getting is the mind-muscle connection. Yep. Is that you might do the bench press, but you just can't quite sense that your chest muscle is feeling anything or yep. getting a workout. Yeah. So if you start your workout, you start your chest workout with a an isolation fly exercise, which primarily works the, the chest muscle, mm -hmm. then that's the only muscle that you can feel. That's the only muscle that has to work in that exercise. Mm -hmm. So already you're developing the mind-muscle link. And what that's doing is it's a lighter exercise. Mm -hmm. It's more of an isolation concentration exercise, gets the blood flowing into the muscle. So it's kind of like priming the muscle mm -hmm. for a compound exercise that might follow later. Okay. So I, I work that way around, and I think also starting off with the primer or isolation exercise, mm -hmm. which, is a, which requires a lighter weight, uh, gets the blood flowing into the muscle, that's also a very useful technique to avoid injury. Mm. Instead of going to the gym and blasting away bench press where you've not really warmed up, mm -hmm. that's where you're, 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 yeah. you're leaving yourself wide open for injury. And then as you say, then you have to take you know, a month off from working out exactly. or something, and, you, you know, what, and there goes everything you've been working on. And I think so. that doing the, the, the way I would do it was to do the isolation primary exercise first, followed up with the compound, maybe strength building exercise afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that, in a way, means that you can't use so much weight with that, with that strength build, the bench press or mm -hmm. the squat. You can't use so much weight, uh -huh. but the muscle doesn't know that. The muscle's still getting a fantastic workout because it's already primed to go to that next exercise. Uh -huh. And, and you say that you should really, um, when you talk about the mind-muscle connection, that it should really be, you should feel it the whole time, right? Exactly. I mean, you should, you know, be uh, strain. Well, it's not straining, but um, you know, squeezing, whatever. You know, you should really be focused on that Absolutely. area. You know, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a focused contraction on that muscle that you want to work out. And when when you're starting off in the gym, if you're a novice or a beginner, it's sometimes difficult to get to get that connection because mm -hmm. it's a new experience for your body. Once you work on those techniques and you get those exercises you know, down, you're, you're happy with, the, with your technique, then it becomes a lot easier to, to, to focus in on the muscle you're working out, especially if you start that given workout with a primer or isolation exercise. Yeah, and I, I was trying that the other day at the gym when, when I read your book, and um, you know, really you do burn out faster that way, or you feel, you know, get more of a burn when you're really trying to... But I thought it was interesting, too, you say that you really only need one set, I think, of eight to ten theoretically, you know, to work the muscle. Although you usually do, what, three sets, right? Because you do the warm-up sets and things. And, yeah. uh, theoretically, um, in terms of science, once the muscle is made to work to a point of failure mm -hmm. with, a given, with, with the maximum weight, uh -huh. once it reaches failure, let's say on that tenth repetition, that's all that's needed to stimulate growth. Hmm. Working to muscular failure, that momentarily failure at that one point in time, that's enough 
of an insult to the muscle to stimulate it to grow. Ah. And in terms of making the muscle grow, you, the science indicates that you want to reach failure at around about six, eight, maybe ten repetitions. Mm -hmm. If you go to a lower repetition range, that's more of a strength mm -hmm. type like of, um, of process. If you go beyond that to a higher repetition range, then it becomes an endurance event. Yeah. So within that six, eight, ten repetition range, if you fail on that last set, with your maximum weight at 10 repetitions, that's enough to make that muscle grow. That's great. But what you can't do is walk straight into the gym and you pick that maximum weight off the, off the rack mm -hmm. and do Just it. Do. You need a, a set or two to build up, and that's why you might have three sets, but there's one functional working set, and that's the last set to failure. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, it's good to know, too, that you don't need five sets of 20 or something, you know, that really the, the warm-up sets plus the one main set. So we'll be right back with Dr. Nick Evans. He's the author of Men's Body Sculpting, Find more secrets to becoming a bodybuilder in no time at all. We're back with Dr. Nick Evans, author of Men's Body Sculpting. Okay, well, I, I took a risk and I emailed you my diet the other day and I, I got a very short reply. <laughs> Thought he, well, he was very tactful about it, but he just said, um, this is not a bodybuilder's diet. <laughs> So, uh, you want to elaborate on that? What, what am I doing wrong, Dr. Evans? I, I think other people can probably relate to some of your, the, the things you're going to hit me over the head with here. So, Well, there's several things that I did like about your diet. I, I felt the fact that you were eating uh, several small meals at regular intervals throughout the day. I think mm -hmm. that's a bonus for one thing. Okay. Um, it's, it, it seems in terms of the science that um, for us to eat you know, I'd say five or six smaller meals during the course of the day mm -hmm. is better than to eat the traditional, you know, breakfast, din uh, lunch, dinner, mm -hmm. three bigger meals uh, during that, let's say, 24-hour period. Yep. The smaller meals means that you're, you're not overloading your stomach, mm -hmm. uh, means that, you know, you're eating at regular intervals, you're keeping your energy level at a fairly constant uh, point throughout the day, so there's no dips and highs in terms of your energy level. So I like the fact that you were eating smaller meals, several smaller meals throughout the day, and that was good. And you were finishing your, um, finishing your eating, I guess, at 7, 30, 8 o'clock at night. Yeah, yeah. Which some people would say that that's a uh, positive benefit if you, if you don't eat that beyond a certain point, let's say your evening meal, mm -hmm. then that's somewhat beneficial in terms of not getting fat as you, as you an excess of calories runs around your body whilst you sleep. Mm -hmm. But you don't sound like you're completely convinced of that or not? I think, I, well, I don't follow that typically. I, th I, like, I keep it simple. I think over a 24-hour period, you take your total calorie intake. Mm -hmm. I don't think it matters whether you eat it in the morning, whether you eat it at night. So you do eat at night? Yes. H how late do you eat? Up to the point. So I, eat, I eat my dinner late. It might even be 9 o'clock. And, but I'm assuming you're not having a Snickers bar or something for dinner. No, it would, it would be a healthy, um, healthy evening meal, you know, breast of chicken with some rice or pasta and uh, some vegetables. Uh -huh. Well, and the, the nice thing about the smaller meals, which I've kind of adjusted over time, you know, from the more traditional to the smaller meals, is just that, you know, you're not as hungry then during the day because you can have, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. You don't have to go for five hours with nothing and then, you know, jump on everything in sight. Well, well your, body be, your, your, your body becomes used to uh, whatever you're, you're putting inside of it. If you're mm -hmm. giving your stomach smaller meals at regular intervals throughout the day, it becomes used to that. It, the stomach can actually contract in size if you're putting less food mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of volume inside of it. If you're going out to a restaurant uh, for lunch and you're having an appetizer, a main meal and a dessert, and suddenly you're walking away with a huge volume of food just stuck there in your stomach because yeah. it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really exit your stomach for at least an hour after you've eaten it. Yeah. So that everything you've eaten on those appetizer plates, the main course and the dessert, it's, that's sat there right in your stomach. So the bigger the volume, you know, the bigger your stomach can be. Mm -hmm. The smaller the volume, the stomach will actually contract down and it then will become satisfied and feel full with much less of a volume of food. So that can actually help you lose weight just from the fact Absolutely. that your stomach is shrinking and... You might take a little while to get used to that, but that, you know, is, is a physiological fact. Kind of like stapling your own stomach. Well, it's a natural <laughs> way of allowing your stomach to, you know, decrease in size. 
Okay, so uh, short, small meals at regular intervals, the total calorie content split up throughout the day can be right. lighter. Um, any other last minute words of advice here for... In terms of your diet, I would just say that, you know, you're, I don't think you're eating enough protein. Mm, more protein. Your diet is, is nicely balanced and it's, it seems to have the correct calorie count, which would work for you. Mm. And, uh, but I, I think that most of your, your, this fruit and vegetables are included to a large extent in your diet. And I think you're missing out on, on uh, some protein that should be included in each meal. I did have a lot of oatmeal. Yes, you did. <laughs> So I just need to do more chicken or turkey or something I like that. I think just simply, know. yes, I mean, whether it's like an egg white omelet that you described mm. or like some tuna or um, some turkey or some chicken or even, you know, a, a, a lean steak once a week. Okay. Well, you know, I, actually, I'm getting kind of hungry right now. I think, I'm gonna, <laughs> I think it's time for me to go get that egg, egg white omelet here. Well, this is Dr. Nick Evans, orthopedic surgeon and author of Men's Body Sculpting, giving you great advice on how to get in shape and if you have a little bit of time. Thank you very much for being here today, Dr. Evans. Thank you, Greg. It was Hope a to have to you here. back again sometime and we'll pick it up from there. Absolutely. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. So, okay, so what else about my diet? What, what did I do that I should do? <laughs>